Uh, this is part of the, um, the ongoing series, you know, the theme of, of um, our church theme for the year is, anybody, anybody tell me? Getting closer to God, getting closer to each other, getting closer to the lost. Okay, this is going to fit in the broad category of getting closer to God. Okay, we're going to be looking at um, getting, I'm going to call this getting closer to Jesus. You know, so this morning we're going to be in Mark's gospel. Any of you have a Bible, uh, you want to turn there, that's fine. If you don't, we've got Bibles in the back if you want to follow along. Otherwise, it'll be up on the screen here. I've been struck and thought about this for years. The image of Jesus that many people have coming out of, say, a Sunday school program. And I'm not faulting this. It's just, you know, is Jesus meek and mild? Jesus, your best friend. Jesus, Mr. Rogers. Jesus holding a, a golden lab puppy. You know? And that's good for kids. That's good for kids. They need to have that, that in their understanding of Jesus because that's there. That's not wrong. Jesus loved children. He was meek and mild. He wasn't forceful. But every now and then in the Gospels, you see something that pops out. The cleansing of the temple is one of those. It's like, whoa. This guy has a backbone and a lot of nerve. <laughs> What we're going to look at this morning are two more pictures out of the Gospels that show us a Jesus that we're not really used to. We're used to Jesus, meek and mild, calm, wouldn't hurt a fly. That's not the Jesus we're going to look at this morning. I hope after this morning, if we spend some time in Mark's Gospel this morning, your, your view of Jesus not will change, but will be broadened, have more depth to it. Mark's gospel is the earliest of the four. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It's the earliest of the four. It is the shortest of the four. It has a, a sense of immediacy to it. Not a lot of extras there. It's all about power, about movement. You see that uh, repeatedly. And then immediately Jesus did this. And then immediately Jesus went over here. And then immediately it's, it's, it's very, there's a lot of action. Um, it's loaded with examples of power and authority, a lot of exorcisms, a lot of miracles. That's the focus in Mark's gospel. And when he's trying to show people, his readers, which includes us, who this Jesus really is. Now, we sang a song just a little bit ago. Praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three in one. You know why we sing songs like that, that identify Jesus as God? How do we know that? Hmm? Because his word tells us. We're going to see two examples of that this morning. What we're looking at on Mark's gospel is part of the reason we have what we call Trinitarian theology. Jesus, God in the flesh. There are four miracles in a block of material. They're in chapters four and five in Mark. On one end of it is a little bit of teachings about, with parables. Mark's gospel doesn't have very much teaching in it. It's very much an action-oriented, but there's a little bit. And there's a little bit of parables, and then there's a block of four miracles. And then there's another little section of parables. So it's like this little, this little package. We're going to look at two of those. The four miracles are power over nature, the stilling of the storm, power over demons, and Satan's kingdom. That's the this spectacular exorcism in uh, the Gadarene demoniac, power over sickness, the woman with hemorrhaging, and then power over death. Those four are a block, and they're designed to be read together. Now, one way you can tell they're designed to be read, when you read the, the number two, the Gadarene demoniac story, it starts out with, and when they arrived at the other side, he got out of the boat. Well, who's he, who's he and who's they? You're supposed to already know that because this feeds right out of the previous one. So we're going to look at, at miracle number one, miracle number two. They're, they're, they're like a set. 
they have something in common. And what they have in common is they show people being scared of Jesus. There's not a, there's not a fuzzy puppy in sight on this. This is, this is sheer power and authority. Uh, can we get number, slide number one? Should be a map. There we go. Okay, just to give us some sense of what's going on. The body of water in the lower center, that blue, that's the Dead Sea. If you look at the top of the Dead Sea and look just to the left, you'll see Jerusalem. Now, if you follow the river coming out of the Dead Sea straight north, there's a small body of water up there, and the area is called Galilee. And that body of water is called the Sea, the lake, the Sea of Galilee. Both of these stories happen there. Most of Jesus' ministry was there. Now, if you look at the lower, um, like, a, like there's a clock face, look at about 4 and 5 o'clock, you'll see a region called Decapolis. That's the, where that Decapolis touches the Sea of Galilee. That's where this story, these stories take place. Decapolis was the ten cities, Deca, Polis, Deca, ten cities. This was a Gentile area. There's several hints that you let you know that this is about a Gentile area. And one is a large number of pigs. That would not have been in Israel. So you've got a miracle that involves Jesus' disciples in a boat. And then you have a miracle of Jesus involving Gentiles and demons and pigs in a Gentile land. Unclean, 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 unclean. <laughs> Interesting, there's only one place on the Sea of Galilee where the description in the Gadarene demoniac story of the steep incline falling into the sea, there's only one place on the perimeter of the Sea of Galilee where that is, and you can go see it today, and it's in that lower corner, about three or four o'clock, right there in that lower corner where it touches the Decapolis, this happened there. And the geography, you can say it's right here, it's got to be right here. All right, let's read, the, um, let's read the text. Interesting little thing here. These, these, um, this block of um, miracles, these four, three of them are in chapter five, but the first one is at the end of chapter four. So the, basically the chapter division's in the wrong place for, for the material. So right at the end of chapter 4. That day, when evening came, he said to his disciples, let us go to the other side. Well, where does that, well, from looking at the map, that means they were on the west side somewhere, and they're going to go to the east side. And Jesus knows what's on the east side. That's Gentile territory. He knows exactly what he's walking into. Let's go to the other side. And leaving the crowd behind, they took him along, just as he was, interesting just as he was, and there were other boats along with them, and a furious squall came up, and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him up and said, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? And he got up, and he rebuked the wind and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. And the wind died down, and it was completely calm. And he said to the, his disciples, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? And they were terrified. That's a really strong word. Terrified? Not they were disturbed, not they were a little like, ooh. That's like, there's no, hey, cool, do it again. Yeah. They are terrified of Jesus. And they ask each other, who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. Fascinating story. This one's very short. The next one is longer. This one's very, very, very short. Some really interesting things here. I mean, picture, you, know, you got to picture the boat. The boat was only like about from me to that wall, if that. They found one of these fishing boats in the Sea of Galilee, sunk in the mud and partially restored it. They know basically how big these things were. They weren't big. It wouldn't even been from here to the wall. They were maybe about seven feet wide, and total, total height was only about like this. 
You put 12 or 15, they could hold about 15 people. If you loaded it down, it wasn't very far above the lake anymore. Uh, who's our boating people? What's that called? Is that draft? But anyway, now the Sea of Galilee is a fairly small body of water. It's about nine miles by 12 miles, kind of irregularly shaped. And it sits in a very, in a depression that has steep sides on it. And the wind will rush down the sides and create squalls, violent, short, but violent storms on the lake. This is what this, this is what's just happened here. They also have to remember this story. You've got professional fishermen in the boat. They knew this lake. They knew what this was. They knew this boat's probably one of their boats. So you've got professionals involved in this. And you know what? When you've got professionals that are scared, you're in serious trouble. <laughs> so just a couple observations here. You know, I picture you know, the boat's filling with water. You know, and, and if the boat's filling with water, what's everybody doing? Bailing with anything. They're like... <laughs> so the disciples are bailing as fast as possible. You know, the, the wind's blowing and the waves are coming over the side. And they say something to Jesus. And Jesus intervenes and says something. And the waves and the winds stop. Not like... They die down over 10 minutes, the way storms kind of pass, you know, and the water's all churned up. Well, how, boating people, how long when the water's really churned up? How long does it take for it to flatten out? A long time. This is, all this is completely abnormal. And the pros, particularly, know it. So they're bailing furiously, and they say something to Jesus, and Jesus stands up and goes, stop it right now. And it stops, and they're going... What? <laughs> what the heck? And then it dawns on them. And they're scared of Jesus. Why? What did they see? You have to remember, this isn't the first miracle they'd seen from Jesus. Earlier in Mark, there are multiple references to entire villages coming out to Jesus. They brought all their sick, all their lame, all their demon-possessed, and he healed them all. They had seen miracle after miracle after miracle after miracle. This wasn't, this wasn't the first miracle they'd seen, but they saw something here that was completely unlike anything they'd seen. They were not prepared for this at all, at any level. What scared them? Power over nature, which implies... Who's, who rules? Who rules the winds and the seas? In the Old Testament, there are multiple references to God and God alone being the master of the seas. So when Jesus stands up and says, stop it right now, and it stops, it takes them a couple seconds, but they put the pieces together. <laughs> and then they're scared. Really scared, badly scared, wet your pants, scared of Jesus. Sorry, that's maybe a little crude, but <laughs> terrified. This isn't the Jesus most of us know. We don't think of him in these terms. Jesus was a, well, there's an interesting point. If I can find my... What was it about this miracle? They had seen power before. They had seen authority before. What did they see here? Hmm? Deity. Notice that Jesus doesn't pray to the Father and ask the Father to still the storm. That would be a logical thing to do. Oh, Jesus, please, you know. Jesus doesn't pray to the Father. Jesus steps up. And acts like God. His authority. He doesn't even say, in the name of the God Jehovah, I command you. He doesn't even do that. He stands up, it's like, I'm telling you. <laughs> Stop. And it stops. And the disciples put the pieces together and they're like, 
who is this? They thought they knew this guy. They'd been traveling with him. They'd seen what he could do, they thought. This was whole new territory, and it scared them to their toes. Let's look at the next one. We can get the next, um, the next slide, but this is a bit longer. Um, I thought about cutting it short, but there may be some people here who really aren't familiar with this story. So it's, it's not terribly long, but it takes a little bit longer. This is one of the longest miracle stories in all the Gospels. It's one of the longest. It has some of the most detail in it, which means it's important. So this is chapter 5 of Mark starting. They went across the lake to the region of the Gerasenes. That's that lower, that southeast corner. When Jesus got out of the boat... A man with an impure spirit came from the tombs to meet him. And this man lived in the tombs. No one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain. He had often been chained hand and foot, but he tore the chains apart and he broke the irons on his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Remember that. Night and day among the tombs and in the hills, he would cry out and cut himself with stones. Now, just a little insert. If you saw somebody behaving like that, what would you think? Demon possessed. What we would call this, psychologists would call this, this is a madman. He is literally crazy. When this man saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and fell on his knees in front of him and he shouted at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? In God's name, do not torture me. Jesus had said to him, come out of this man, you impure spirit. This demon knows who Jesus is. Nobody introduced him. Mr. Demon, Mr. Jesus, Mr. Jesus. That doesn't happen. The demon knows who he's talking to. And he also knows where the authority level is. Jesus says, what is your name? And the demon says, my name is Legion, for we are many. And he begged Jesus again and again not to send them, all of the demons, out of the area. A Roman legion was 6,000 soldiers. Now, he's using it apparently here just as a large number because we get an actual number here in just a little bit. But this gives you an idea of how bad a shape this guy was in. A large herd of pigs was feeding on the nearby hillside, and the demons begged Jesus, send us among the pigs, allow us to go into them. So he gave permission, and the impure spirits came out and went into the pigs, and the herd, about 2,000 in number, rushed down the steep bank into the lake and were drowned. Those tending the pigs ran off and reported this in the town and the countryside, and the people went out to see what had happened. And when they came to Jesus, listen to the sequence, when they came to Jesus, they saw the man who had been possessed by a legion of demons sitting there, sitting he had been roaming, restlessly roaming, night and day. Now he's seated, he's dressed, and he's in his right mind. And look at the reaction. Those who had seen it told the people what had happened about the demon-possessed man and told them about the pigs. Then the people began to plead with Jesus to leave. Why? They're scared of him. As Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed begged to go with him. The word beg appears in here <laughs> repeatedly. Jesus did not let him, but said, Go home to your own people, tell them how much the Lord has done for you, and how he has had mercy on you. So the man went away and began to tell in the Decapolis, that whole region, the ten cities, how much Jesus had done for him, and all the people were amazed. Now here's some observations. It's Gentile territory. There would have been some Jews mixed in the population, but this is predominantly Gentile territory. The fact that there's a large herd of pigs tips that. You never would have seen that in Israel. Gentile, in this case, means pagan. These aren't Jews. They're not monotheists. They don't think of one God. The Roman and Greek pantheons were many gods, many goddesses, the demon-possessed man runs up and says, 
son of the most high God. A Jew wouldn't have used that term. It would just be the son of God. There's it. There's only one God. That's it. End of discussion. This is a, this is a pagan. This is a pagan response. This is a pagan term. Because there was a hierarchy. God's goddesses, you know, there were, he said, the most high, the number one. You're the son of the number one most high God in this, in this pantheon. So you're dealing with pagans here. The fact that the term legion is used points how badly overwhelmed this man was. None of us are a match for even one demon. What is this guy's life like? He is complete, his entire life, every aspect of his life is completely overwhelmed. He is literally not in control of his own life or his own person, 24-7. You could hardly picture a scenario, a more frightening scenario of demon activity than this. But it also shows, this number, legion, also shows how powerful Jesus is. How bad this guy has it. But how powerful Jesus is. So it's. The local folks obviously were scared of this madman. It said they had repeatedly tried to chain him. It says it, says it repeatedly. They had tried many times to chain him. Nobody could control him. He was, just, he was far more powerful than they were. And they knew it. So when they see the demon, this demoniac, sitting, clothed, and in his right mind, they're scared. Of what? Of Jesus. They don't even know what Jesus is. And that wasn't a mistake. They don't know who he is. They don't know what he is. Is he one of the gods? Who has this kind of authority? Is this a demon, a higher level demon that just did this? We don't, we don't know what to do with this guy. And they're scared. And you have about 2,000 dead animals, which is a fortune, floating in the water as collateral damage. See, the, the Greek and Roman gods were not good. Not in our sense of the word. They were, we think of God as being good. The Greek and Roman gods weren't good. Some of them were downright evil. They were malevolent. They were vindictive. They were petty. They were unpredictable. If this guy is one of the Greek and Roman gods and he just did this and we've got 2,000 dead pigs, maybe it would be better if... Thank you very much. <laughs> They're scared. They're scared of a show of authority and power beyond anything they had ever seen or could muster themselves. This is just sheer authority. Notice that it, as in the previous miracle, Jesus doesn't pray. He doesn't ask God to deliver this guy. He doesn't even claim like what we might say derived authority in the name of the god jehovah i command this demon to come out he doesn't even use that formula what's he do he commands his own authority that's it out you all of you <laughs> now out and they leave now the de the uh, gadarenes the people that lived in that region may not have had a very clear concept of god but you know what they had a clear concept of? Power. They might not have been able to understand exactly how this all played out, but they know what that was. When Jesus, just before these, this block of, of uh, miracle stories, Jesus is challenged by the authorities and they say, the reason he can cast out demons is because he's doing it through the power of the prince of demons. They're saying, basically, Jesus is either Satan or is in league with Satan. That's how he could have authority over demons. And he says, first of all, that's an idiot idea. Because if the kingdom of Satan is challenged, is fighting inside each other, it's doomed. But then he says, 
and he tells a little parable. And it's very short. It's like one verse, maybe two verses. He said, when a strong man is in his house with his treasure, everything is safe. But when a stronger man comes along and overpowers him, then the stronger man can take all the man's goods. That's the explanation Jesus gives for what he's doing. So in the parable, who's Jesus? He's the stronger man. Who's Jesus in this, par in this scenario? He's the stronger man. They never heard Jesus teach that, but they recognized the principle. Somebody far more powerful than what was in that demoniac is here among us. And they were scared of him. Notice, here's just a little interesting thing. Notice, you got you to remember, there's an, there's an entire crowd around him, around Jesus and his 12, probably his 12 disciples. Notice that they don't demand that he leaves. Nobody says, you and your 12 guys in the boat, you got 10 minutes starting now. We want you out, you know. Nobody organizes a crowd to force him away. How come? Because what they just saw, they're like, you don't want to upset this guy. Look what he, did. This, look what he just did. That could be people floating in the lake next time. Just so they beg him. Different translations. Plead, entreat. They're like, please, please. Just lovely having you here. Please. Just. <laughs> Interesting to compare the people's reaction to this miracle to the healed man's reaction. They beg him to leave. The healed man begs to go with him. Begs him, please, let me, just let me get in the boat. Let me. <laughs> Jesus won't let him. Jesus got a job for him. Go tell your people, your people on the map, the Decapolis, go tell your Gentile people what God has done for you. The one true God, the God of Israel. Go tell them what God has done for you. And the man goes out and tells everyone what... Jesus did for it. Do you see the, you see the little, you see what Mark's doing here? The guy's not disobeying. The guy's not disobeying by saying, let me tell you what Jesus did for me. That is what God did for him. So, two very dramatic stories. Why are these included in Mark? Mark had lots of material he could have worked with. Why are these two here? What is the effect these are supposed to have on his readers? Then, but also now, same thing. What effect is this supposed to have? You have jaw-dropping show of power over nature, followed by a jaw-dropping <laughs> show of authority over the forces of darkness. What effect does this have? This isn't Jesus holding a fuzzy puppy. Hmm? Yeah. This, I'm hoping this will change our perceptions of Jesus. Because I suspect most people, including my own, our perspective on Jesus is too mild. Too tame. Too nice. To Mr. Rogers, I got nothing against Mr. Rogers. It's just, you know, it's a nice guy. Nice guy. The disciples thought they knew Jesus. They'd been with him for a while. They'd seen him do all kinds of stuff. They thought they knew this guy. And then the stilling of the storm happens and they realize they know nothing They didn't really know who they were dealing with. They didn't really understand who they were dealing with. They vastly underestimated him. And I suspect that we do the same. Do you really know who you're dealing with? When you sing about Jesus, when you talk about Jesus, when you pray, when you invoke Jesus' name, do you really? 
Do you really understand who you're dealing with? Do you underestimate him? I know I do. Terry Slice was up here last week. He is battling terminal cancer. It was just excellent, powerful, so valuable, but painful, though. Painful. Terry doesn't need Jesus holding a fuzzy puppy. Terry needs this Jesus. And so do you. This isn't Jesus who wouldn't hurt a fly. This is Jesus, the Son of God. Jesus strong. Jesus powerful. Jesus mighty to heal. Mighty to deliver. Mighty to save. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The worship team could come back up. And I'm going to say no, no official prayer team. Um, just close this with a short prayer. They're going to play a song. And then I think Brian is going to come up with some uh, maybe a closing prayer or closing remarks. So let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. And I thank you for the detail that is there. For us to explore and learn more about you. Some of the really important things are hidden in the details. So I thank you for your word. I thank you for your spirit that makes it alive to us. And I pray for every person that hears this. That we will take this to heart. That this will permanently change how we think about Jesus. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.